human rights activist Yeonmi Park's journey to New York was nothing short of extraordinary. Born in North Korea in 1993, she grew up under the dictatorship of Kim Jong-il. With Yeonmi's father facing imprisonment and with a famine sweeping over the nation, her family fled oppression when she was 13 years old, escaping over the border into China. It was in China she had fallen into the hands of human traffickers, but with the help of Christian missionaries, Yeonmi and her mother reached Mongolia, claiming asylum and eventually finding freedom in South Korea. She's now an economic student at Columbia University. Her story is documented in a memoir titled In Order to Live, and I'm pleased to welcome Yeonmi as part of our digital series of conversations at a time when North Korea has been propelled to the forefront of international diplomacy. Yeonmi, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank I want you. to get to your personal story, um, but let's first just talk about that summit that took place. Um, hard to think of a more remarkable meeting between two world leaders in modern history. When you watched the events unfold in Singapore, mm. uh, did it leave you with a sense of optimism or with a degree of pessimism? One was a leader who was democratically elected and one was a dictator who got the throne from his own father. So it was not a normal diplomatic meetings. It was not the meetings between Canadian prime minister and the American president. It was a literally a dictator who killed all, all his people to be in his, in his power and came to the table. So it, the meeting itself uh, was a problematic because we were accepting dictator as a just normal leader. And he's not our leader because I never voted and we never elected him to become our president. This is a dictatorship which you've experienced firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, you were born in North Korea in 1993. That was a year before Kim Jong-il, the father yeah. of Kim Jong-un, rose to power. You write in your memoir that you grew up um, under what's known as emotional dictatorship. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? The North Korea, being in North Korea is not only you're not free physically. Like, for instance, today I'm wearing earrings, jackets, like, like all these dresses. In North Korea, they regulate everything. They tell you what to wear. They tell you what to you know, see, what to watch, what to listen. They, you can even dance freely in North Korea. But not only that, they don't let you think freely. And that was the biggest uh, a difficulty for me to overcome. And when you grew up in the 90s, that was a time of particular mm -hmm. economic hardship in North Korea. The country experienced um, a severe famine. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the impact that had on you and your family. I mean, it definitely affected my growth. And North Korean people, even till this day, they are shorter, you know, than like four inches on average than their brothers in South Korea. In just like remember in the 90s, if you go in the in the morning to the train stations, you they just put all these dead bodies in the, this carriage and they push them. One of the things you wrote in your book is that your parents mm -hmm. feared falling asleep during that famine because yeah. they thought they might pass away and not be able to tend for their kids, yeah. which was pretty remarkable. Another thing you talk about in your book, and it's been at the forefront of these recent negotiations, is the issue of human rights. Mm -hmm. And when we talk specifically about human rights, the imprisonment of what the UN estimates of being about 80 to 120,000 North Koreans in political prison camps. Yeah. Um, that was something your family experienced firsthand. During the famine, your father was forced, as a way of tending to his family, looking after his fa family, into going into black market dealing, where he traded valuable metals and cigarettes. He was imprisoned for that. Talk to me a little bit about the impact that had on him, both physically and psychologically. I mean, he was a human being, but he, he got arrested. And the, we don't have a thing called a lawyer. We don't even have a term for human rights in North Korea. That was the thing when I came to the West, when I heard the term animal's rights. I couldn't comprehend. What do you mean animals have rights in this world? Why, as a North Korean, that I did not even know I had the right to be a human being. So that he, as a human being, he just arrested for the normal trading that we do. He was not like selling drugs or selling weapons. He was involved in informal trading where we are selling valuable matters or like food. And they arrested him and they tortured him and they sent, sentenced him more than 10 years without even letting our family member to come to the, any trial. And when he was released, what sort of impact did you see it having he, on him? He got out to be, to cure his, he was got the colon cancer and got to sick leave. And he wasn't even able to look at human eyes again because in that prison, 
they tell them that they are less valued than animals. They are not even la letting these prisoners to look at the, these uh, police soldiers' uh, eyes. And that just change destroys his like psychology, everything. It just destroys everything, they, what it means to be a human being. What happens to you next is, is absolutely extraordinary. You leave North Korea, you escape over the border into China, mm -hmm. and for two years you're in the hands of human traffickers, you're exploited sexually. You write in your book that those two years were almost more brutal than what you'd experienced in the years gone by. You eventually escape through the desert into Mongolia. You find asylum in South Korea, and you end up in New York, where you are able to start a new life. For many people who have left North Korea, I guess the temptation is to build a new life, yeah. forget about the past, and mm. stay quiet, yet you continue to speak out. Because you speak out, the North Korean government have labelled you a, quote, human rights propaganda puppet. Yeah. Why do you continue to choose to speak out, despite that pressure from the North Korean government? Uh, I mean, many, many reasons. One, that I want to go home. I didn't leave North Korea because I hated the country or hated the people. I love my country. It's my hometown. It's my forever home. But I just hated the system. I was hungry. That's why I left. I do consider myself a very lucky person that my father passed away in China, like having no funeral. He was just, I, we had to criminate me. I was 14 years old and had to bury him on the ground at the age, I mean, in the middle of night. I, and I know even till this day right now that girls like myself, 13, 15, 14, 20, they sold for like $100, $200. Imagine you, well, how much it costs to buy a cell phone that we have in our hand. Our lives as, no, as North Korean defectors, our lives are less worth than the phone that we have. And this is happening in 21st century right now today. I, I cannot comprehend how this is possible. Why these Northern people have to be punished for their birthplace? All they have done was being born in that country. So I think that one, I'm so lucky that I have this platform, I have this voice. And, you know, North Korean regime, even the guy that who we met, that Trump praised for him to be a great leader, that Trump said Kim Jong-un loves his own people, he's targeting me, he's, he's still trying to silence me. What's, right now. what's the strategy of Kim Jong-un right now? What do you think his intention is by going to the table with the United States? He's a fooling, fooling us. He's on, it's almost like I think we are being brainwashed, Kim, this Kim Jong-un, as Northern people, had to be brainwashed and being under his power. And now, as you see, that people are romanticizing this dictator. And they say, oh, after all, he's not a, that bad guy. Look at him. He's like a charming person. I mean, our president here, he's got charmed by this dictator and he's praising him, how impressed he is by Kim Jong-un. And that's what he's doing. Do you think, though, there could be... I don't think anyone doubts at all the um, despicable human rights record in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance, however, that there is a change of mentality here? There is a willingness to open up and um, improve conditions in North Korea? Or do you think by assuming that we're being naive when we take a look at the intentions of Kim Jong-un? Right, so that, I think there's two things. Kim Jong-un went to school in Switzerland. He knows what's exactly happening. He knows what human beings deserve. That we don't need to let Kim Jong-un know that how wonderful the rest of the world is. He uses his starvation. North Korea is not a poor country. They just build these missiles. So why Kim Jong-un is not feeding his people is not because he doesn't have money. He doesn't want to feed them because he wants to control them, to starve them. Yami Park, it's an important perspective at an important time. Um, North Korea defector, memoirs titled In Order to Live, a student at Columbia University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.